Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Let's Talk Parks. I'm thankful and excited that you have decided to join in on this episode. This is a special one for me because I am interviewing Lakita Frazier, who is a relatively new member to our team, although it's somehow already been like a year or close to. Um, and so we are teaming up and Lakita is going to be one of the co-hosts on this show, which I'm really excited for as we just continue to evolve the show and continue to make hopefully valuable content that you all want to listen to. Now, for this episode, we get into the topics of trust, uh, innovation, culture, creativity, and in our discussion around these topics, we dive into like how does it actually look for us to have a culture of trust and innovation, and then also how diversity, equity, and inclusion really play a much larger role in this than maybe I would have assumed or thought before my conversation with Lakita. I will also say too that um, I found that the more that I pay attention to topics like these, or I try to, you know, I've been reading a lot of books recently, um, a topic related or a book related to this topic is the 15 commitments of conscious leadership, which I highly recommend. But I will say too, anytime that you immerse yourself into these new lessons, the world has a way of, of really bringing home that lesson. Right. And so, um, I do hope that this episode gives you some, some insights and some behind the scenes into those, those conversations that probably need to happen in order to create the culture that you want, but also expect to make mistakes along the way, expect to not get it right, expect to get it wrong so that you can learn how to make it right. And, um, you know, I think along with creating this culture of trust and, and innovation and risk is this idea of, well, in order to take risks, you have to put yourself out there. You have to make mistakes. You have to learn how you're going to do better in the future. And that doesn't come from reading a book. It doesn't come from listening to a podcast or making one. Um, it just comes with time and experience and putting yourself out there, building connections and, um, and trying new things. So I hope that this episode is thought provoking. I could listen to Lakita all day long, and I'm sure many of you have, if you've gone to, you know, director school, revenue school, if you've had the pleasure of, you know, going to the women in parks recreation conference, I just, uh, am, I'm always impressed by everything that Lakita is doing. And I couldn't be more honored to be working alongside someone like Lakita and honestly, the rest of our our team here at Barry Dunn. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this episode and we'll be back soon for another episode. Thanks. All righty. Hello everybody. And welcome back to Let's Talk Parks. I'm so excited to be joined by Lakita Frazier. Hello, Lakita. Hey, Becky. How are you doing this great day? I'm doing awesome. So Lakita is a senior consultant at Barry Dunn now, and I'm just so excited. And um, gosh, has it been almost a year now? Or when almost, you- almost. August seventh will be a year. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That happened so fast. It did. It did. Well, awesome. So I am so looking forward to our conversations on this podcast, and this is just the start of a new adventure of co-hosting the podcast together. And we've got so many great topics coming up in conversations. And I know so many people in Parks and Recreation know who you are. You've been around the world doing a world tour, as you said, <laughs> conferences and presentations. And I just, I admire you so much for that. I, could, I couldn't do it at the pace that you're doing, number one but also just the influence that you've had on the field is um, truly remarkable. So for those that don't know you, can you provide a little bit of background as far as your history in the field and kind of where you've worked and then kind of what led you here? 
Wow, thank you so much for those kind of words, Becky. So I um I always joke when I do presentations, I've been around since the 1900s <laughs> in parks and recreation. It has been a complete joy. I, I fell in it as often many of us have. Um, and I uh, started off as a part-timer in my hometown, worked my way up over the years, uh, was the director of parks and recreation in the city of Suffolk, Virginia for about 15 years. I moved on then to Richland County in South Carolina. And throughout this time frame, as you know, um, working in programming and leading initiatives and capital improvement planning, um, it has always just been a, a connection through my, my local, like my state associations and my national uh, memberships that have just connected me with so many people that have really continued for me to fall in love with this thing called recreation. So after 30 years of being in this field um, on the public side, I transitioned over here to Barry Dunn in last August. And it has been phenomenal, a great experience to be able to bring uh, the years that I've um, been in recreation and things that I've learned the, places I've been, the things that I've seen, the great work that's being done all across the country uh, to be able to bring that and to share that even more to help people um, do what we love in the best, what I believe is the best profession, parks and recreation. So here we are. Here we are. I love it. I love it. Well, today I'm excited because we get to dive into a topic that you've actually done a presentation about, um, which is all about creating a culture of innovation. And so let's just start there. So why is creating a culture of innovation important? Well, you know, what I've learned throughout the years, um, directly, and as I continue to work with clients to implement strategies, identify the best ways to uh, provide programs and facilities to their to their citizens and constituents. Uh, I found that it is because people are able to, when you're in our field, sit and really talk about what's happening. And so that is to me creating that space of innovation. It is that space where you're able to brainstorm those new programs, those new policy ideas, uh, those new approaches to new problems. We, we all know, as we talk about the uh, pre-pandemic uh, parks and recreation and then the post, and, and that has also had a major impact on how our um, environments are responding innovatively. But when you create an innovative environment, you are improving the department and the agency because you're creating a space where people are able to bring their true authentic selves and experiences um, to solve the problems or to create new opportunities um, to address the needs of the people. Um, I also believe that when you are creating those innovative environments where, as the years that I was a director, one thing for me, I always had an open door policy. And people will say, you know, Lakita, that becomes a little exhausting, doesn't it? That's all. No, not from the perspective of it was a place where if you wanted to uh, just gripe. No, it wasn't that. It was a space where if you did even have an idea or had a question about a new procedure or policy that was occurring, I wanted an environment where people felt comfortable in improving the agency and how they felt they could contribute to it. So uh, those are, are some of the reasons why I believe that creating that environment is important. That's interesting. Well, Lakia, what happens when you don't create a culture of innovation? Like, what's the effect of that? People just show up. I believe that as we talk about the skin in the game, I play sports, I play basketball, and then I also ran track. And I look at those sports from how you contribute to the overall team. So whenever I was on the basketball court, you're up there with four of the, your teammates, and you're all up there at the same time working towards getting the ball to the hoop. And, and you figure out how you contribute in that way. And then I ran track. And so it was an individual sport. But then at the end, you your points will contribute to the overall team. So when you are not able to contribute, you, I don't believe, you are able to um, come with your true self. And the team misses out on that. Um, and also, when it's not an innovative environment, 
people start looking for places where their opinions are valued. Because when we talk about like, what is the culture of innovation? It's a space where it's an emphasis on collaboration and strong communication. So let's say if you're not allowing those things to happen, people do start looking elsewhere. And I do believe that is that people don't leave bad jobs. They leave bad bosses or bad environments. And a lot of that comes from not able to see yourself in the vision and being able to contribute to the culture. You just reminded me of something that I've thought about before, but I'm not sure if it will land or how it's going to, how I'm going to be able to communicate this, but it's almost like what I'm hearing you say is innovation is all about creating a, a safe space where people feel comfortable to be themselves. But the ironic thing is that like being innovative is associated with taking risks and, yes. you know, kind of the opposite of what safety is. Yeah. But that's what we're trying to create is that place where people feel like they can be themselves. Now, say one of the tenets um, of this environment is people having the freedom to fail. Um, And and we don't say, well, you know, it is constantly making the same mistake over and over again. But when people have the freedom to fail, they're willing to take a chance to share that idea, present that new program. And uh, that provides them with a learning experience on how to continue to uh, move forward because I tried this and this may then work, but let me try something else. But if no one's trying anything, if everyone is just showing up and doing the same thing that they've always done, you're going to get the same results. So uh, I do find that quite interesting in, in creating one of those spaces is being able to have confidence and allowing people to fail. Mm. One of the most impactful things that my one of my first bosses ever said to me was, Becky, it is okay to make mistakes here. Like we're expecting you to make mistakes. And that is such a small thing to say to a new employee, but it meant absolutely everything because it allowed me to be like, okay, have some grace for myself, have some patience. Like I'm going to get there. Right. But it's like, yeah. I have to make all these mistakes in the meantime in order to learn. And you know, in an innovative environment, learning is paramount. It is it is creating a space where your team members are able to tie into training and professional learning opportunities to help sharpen those same skills that we want them to have to accomplish the goals. So as we continue to say, wow, we want to grow a lot of new employees when we're recruiting new talent, they want to be in organizations and companies where their professional development is a priority and is supported. Hmm. So then how, what are some practical ways you mentioned this earlier, kind of leaving your door open and being able to have those conversations. Are there other practical ways that we can kind of build in opportunities to be innovative? Yes. You know, we incorporate it within your everyday strategies. We're all meeting, (laughs) whether virtually or in person. Carve out time in those meetings to say, what are you doing new? What are you hearing that's new and different? Is there something that we should be trying that someone else is doing that we haven't tried yet? Um, How have you contributed to creating something different or addressing a problem or or coming up with a solution that no one else came up with. Creating space where people are able to report out and celebrate that innovation. Now, of course, you can get into creating metrics and creating, you know, specific targets towards innovation. But from that baseline is creating that space in existing areas where people are already gathering, just carving out that few moments to say, what are we doing different? Find out what we're doing different and celebrate what we're doing different and see how can we duplicate that? Because a lot of times when you have this innovative culture, you have an environment, not only from a staff retention perspective, people want to be there, but the service and the products that people are putting out are at a higher quality. Hmm. Studies show that. Hmm. Yes. I love Research, 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 research. (laughs) When it comes to how team members respond to ideas or maybe leadership responds, what are some things that you see are really effective for encouraging more innovative thought, even if sometimes the ideas don't quite land or they're not maybe the right timing for that idea? I think that the role that individuals that we can play in leadership, I believe that 
I always say this, that it, it doesn't take a title for us to lean. So we all are leaders in our spaces. And then, of course, we have administration of those of us that those that are leading the charge and, and pushing us all towards the vision. I think that that is really the key is really from the leadership perspective. If we're going to talk about from those individuals that people are also reporting to and then those of us that are in positions that people are reporting to us is keeping the vision forward. I think that tying what we do on a regular basis back to the big picture, the vision and the mission of your agency, your business, it that is a key to creating that innovative because people know that we're not just doing something to do it. We're working towards something. So I think tying that into your performance is okay, not in a negative way, but in a way to, again, go back and recognize and celebrate that innovation. So when leadership creates a bar or sets the standard and then celebrates it through the vision and mission, it shows people that, hey, we're, we're doing this and, and it's okay for me to share and I'm a part of that big picture. Does that make mm-hmm. any sense? It does. It really does. And it, it, um, it makes me think of the phrase, like we've always done it that way. It's very much like past focused, Mm -hmm. right? Like in the past we've done this and it didn't work. So now this certainly won't work. You know, if you were to put yourself in, you know, a board meeting or a conference room and you're with, you know, a director who's saying, well, you know, we've always done it that way. How would you respond to that in order to get your ideas across? Well, I think that what's important is when you are in those situations where you can is being prepared and, and understanding how your how your idea is going to land on the individuals in the room. If I was in and I'd done my research and I know that this is for instance, a controversial subject of closing a facility and what would that replacement of that particular facility, you know, I was working with someone and that was one of the issues is how do we rectify an issue of a pool being closed for over 30 years? And then you have the the department come in and say, here are some ideas, some innovative ideas towards addressing it, but it's not going to be the same exact thing that you had. It's it's going to be more of an aquatics zero entry spray park facility. We're not able to replace the pool and this is why. So of course, this is definitely innovative thinking for this particular community. Like they 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 are used to a pool. And so here we are saying, well, well, how well the pool, unfortunately, we can't do. So when introducing that concept, I found it very important to engage all of the stakeholders and the people that are going to be impacted by this innovative change, this idea from the children to the uh, other neighborhoods that surround the, the community that will have to uh, utilize this particular facility, uh, tying in the existing facilities that were already there, uh, creating a justification for it being a different approach than going with the same approach, but also being transparent about the why and the costs that were associated. So even when we have an innovative idea or innovative strategy, being able to be transparent on how you got to that space, why you think that this is the best way to approach whatever it is we're trying to solve, uh, so that those that make that final decision have enough information to make a knowledgeable decision. And being okay when it still doesn't land. I think that's the bigger piece. It's like, I don't want to say anything. They never listen to me. And then we might stop talking. We might clam up. I want to encourage individuals to strategize that conversation when you know that you do have that input and you may be a little shy around. I mean, when I first got here, it was a little nerve wracking. Like, you know, it's kind of like that expectation. It's like, we know Akita, she's, she teaches at the rector school. She does revenue management. So I know she's going to be able to, it was totally different. And so finding a space and how to add my idea or be innovative, it was first reading the room and being mindful of how that idea would land. And so I know that was a lot, but I wanted to share it for like our our listeners that are introducing those ideas, then also for those of us that are impacted or afraid to sometimes <laughs> introduce that idea. Yes, no, that's valuable advice. And, and I like the example that you provided too. I think it really, like a lot of people could relate to that. And I think being able to just know that it's a long-term 
play and we're not looking for a lot of short term gains. Yeah. You know, it's like sometimes you just have to plant the seed and see where it lands, you know, a month from now, a couple of years from now. Yes. Yes. You're exactly right. You're exactly yeah. right. So Lakita, tell us more about what diversity, equity, inclusion has to do with innovation. Like, how are they linked? You know, it is a valuable conversation as we in the field of parks and recreation um, service, public and private, uh, we provide services to so many communities and those communities that we're in, those that we even live and work in are not exactly like us, but social economic status, racial, gender, uh, education. There are so many factors to how diversity impacts our communities. So as leaders in what I believe service and recreation, our role in that innovative environment is making sure that we create the spaces at the tables for those that dialogue. And I say that by saying I was I was at a conference at NRPA once and a parks and recreation director, we were talking about some community engagement. And it was one of the communities that he went into. And as they were getting the data towards their new master plan, he said that the citizen came in and was like, oh, I guess this is going to be the same vanilla latte um, of parks and recreation. And that was very powerful for him because it's like, oh, my gosh. It's like when they looked at the room, the individuals that were providing the information were not representative of all of the citizens that they were serving in that community. So when you're having those diverse perspectives from your teammates that come from different backgrounds, it ensures that your team approaches a problem from multiple angles. And this can lead to faster resolutions. One of your presentations talks about how having these different perspectives allows you to see things from different angles, but it also, you, you also talk about how it allows you to adapt to change more easily. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, let's see. When you are in a space where you are faced with providing services I often find, especially being an African-American woman in this field, it's like the question of, does she really know? <laughs> does she really know about the dimensions of the softball field or, or the tennis courts? And when I come into these spaces, it's so important for me to create a dialogue that goes beyond any of what we physically see, but opening our minds to the overall goal and wanting to serve the people that were using that softball field. And, and I use that example as I'm in some of these communities and you're learning and you're growing. And that experience with me and how I communicate and how I get the information and how I approach the problem and solve it, it now allows an individual to interact with me and people that look like me and the confidence in knowing that, wow, everyone that loves recreation doesn't have to look like me. And everyone that gets recreation services may not approach it in the same way. Like I did, I grew up in a traditional community with the playground and we had one recreation center that served all of us, but there, the public pool is about three miles away. And so then we had a pool that individuals of color could not go to as I was growing up. So when you understand and experience that firsthand and you're able to talk about that in rooms where people that may have not experienced it, it creates a trusting environment because you learn something now about a culture or a place or a people that you wouldn't have known if that person wasn't ever in the room. So when we talk about the importance of swim lessons in our communities, like communities that have high number of minorities and underserved populations, it is extremely important that swim lessons are available because we don't swim at the rates of our counterparts. So those are examples of ways that when you learn from someone, I mean, even here in our community, we have a growing influx of um, the Latino Hispanic community, which is definitely different for us. And 
how do we maneuver? Are we maneuvering? Are we providing translation services? How are we approaching our changing communities? Because all of our communities are changing. Mm -hmm. It's really that it goes back to the whole concept of innovation, of, of needing to keep up with change. And so it makes perfect sense that when you have people that have gone through different experiences, yes. we all have different perspectives. And so then, but it does require that, that environment that we were talking about in that last episode in order to share those experiences and actually learn from it. And being intentional about it as we are, as, as we are in our spaces and talking about how do we make sure that we have everyone in the room? How do we ensure access to spaces where transportation may be limited? If you've always had a car, for instance, it's hard to understand how people with who never driven a car got around in a community that was built around cars. Mm -hmm. So I say that as you even look at the way that you approach uh, developing bike lanes and, and getting input, really talk to people that walk, not just for leisure, but because it is by necessity. So I think that's that's an important thing as we look at our communities all across America. They were built for, for cars. And so if you have walkers, you know, it is now important for us to really look at how can we get access for everyone. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would like to talk about a little bit more, and it was from a quote that you had put in one of your presentations, but it's around like this sense of respect and trust. And it was related to equitable pay and creating equitable environments, but respect and trust. And I think it it seems like it also goes back to what we were talking about earlier around when an idea or you know, maybe a confrontational statement or anything gets shared, kind of wondering how it's going to be received. But, you know, in my limited experience, I feel like it's just seems like it's if you have a foundation of respect then a lot of those conversations come a little bit easier but what's your take on that like how how do we create a culture of respect and trust being willing to have uncomfortable conversations sometimes i think is important i think that uh, we all do come from various backgrounds and experience things in different ways and so if you have an experience or when you have that trusting environment, you can say, wow, you know, when this occurred or as I looked at, for instance, I know while being in the public sector, when selecting and you probably even as we're as you're selecting things for branding and marketing, we we have to be we need to be intentional about the representation as we're selecting, you know, pictures and various things. And I think that that goes back to being intentional about having that conversation like, hey. Uh, I see that we have this, but when I look at the, our demographic, maybe we should choose things that speak to all of our individuals. I think that is the, the having those, being willing to have those uncomfortable conversations and ask the uncomfortable question, because I think that sometimes people say, man, I want to ask, but I'm not comfortable asking. And I think having that open communication is extremely important. And reading and learning and, and doing something different, something that I read some once was to uh, go to a different place to eat, authentic place to eat as often, or when you're out and you're traveling to expose ourselves to other cultures and other foods and other um, experiences. So I think being intentional is important about helping create those trusting environments being willing to lead those conversations. It sounds like a lot of that too is it takes courage to it, be able yeah. Yeah. to ask those questions, but then also to answer those questions because yeah. it doesn't always seem like there's a right answer necessarily, but it's just kind of sharing from your own perspective. And yeah, so anything else in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion and the link to innovation? I think the link to innovation is, is, is important to, again, when you're uh, when you are brainstorming, as we talked about in the previous episode, um, and when you're identifying new programs and ideas, when you have the different backgrounds, the different people at the table, you are able to come up with things that you possibly wouldn't if everyone had the same background and everyone came from the same perspective. Uh, for instance, if you're looking at putting a 
new concession stand and we're doing restrooms. I remember a gentleman sharing with me, he said, Akita, we're doing restrooms. And when I looked at my team, he said my team was all men. And one of my women we called in uh, to participate was our custodial staff. And she's like, I think it's important. Why don't we have a baby changing station in? And so, again, it's, it's that thought of while there are, of course, men that change papers everywhere. We do know that. But as we're building and doing things, having those diverse perspectives will help us now go ahead and put that in at the beginning of the project and not having to come and put it back later because we did have a different voice at the table. So that's what I think. Innovation and thoughts come out of different voices when they're able to be heard. We talked about this a little bit. What is a trusting environment and what are some common things that we might notice in a trusting environment? I would say a trusting environment is an environment where individuals are communicating frequently about the goals, the successes, the challenges, the direction, the correction. I'm a big believer in that. I think that we have to create ways that are effective and efficient in that communication. And I'm learning those every day being here. Utilizing technology, whatever it takes. Because when people, when you're communicating, when you're talking to people, they're talking to you, you're listening, you're getting feedback, that builds trust because it's like, well, man, I just talked to Becky yesterday <laughs> or man, I haven't spoken to Becky in about six weeks. So I, that could be an issue that her and I haven't discussed. But when you're communicating frequently, it does leave less room for things to fall through the cracks and consistency creates trust and relationships. I believe that in those trusting environments, you build workplace relationships. You are able to, you know, I've heard people say this for years and and, and I, I watched it. I, I looked at it. I made sure that I monitored when people talk about clicks. <laughs> you know, I've been a girl all my life. Right. So I've been in whether I'm, I'm, I'm the one of five sisters. OK, so that was my own clique of sisters. Then you have your, your cliques, maybe in your personal life in church or in other spaces. I believe there are cliques in various spaces. When we talk about building workplace relationship, we're not talking about cliques, but you build relationship with like minded individuals that are working towards some of those same spaces or goals. Like some people are more of the spreadsheet, the data, the analysis, and you cling to them because you want to learn and get more of that. So you trust based off of their work that, man, I can really learn from that person. And then the same thing, those of us that that have that side of our brain that love to do the writing, the, the reading, the presenting of it, building those relationships, because I can build those relationships with individuals that have, have a proven track record of innovation through their writing and through their work. So that's where I believe that trusting environments build those workplace relationships. And then lastly, it promotes uh, transparency. When you are promoting transparency about your policies, your procedures, your actions, how we're doing things, how are we doing as an organization, as a company, people trust you because they're seeing the numbers, they're seeing the attendance, they're able to be in those spaces and know what's happening. And when people know what's happening, they are trusting. Hmm. <laughs> I know it's a lot. <laughs> No, it makes sense. And like so many, so much of what you're saying is, is, is common sense in a way. It's like, it's simple, just communicate and build relationships and, and, you know, be transparent. But I think the reality is, of it is it's hard to, hard. It's hard. You know, what do you think out of those three, like, what is the most challenging one that you, you see or that you've experienced um, out of those three? Communicating frequently um, because there's so many various things that we all are doing on a daily basis in our world, you know, the managing of various projects, ensuring that our clients are being taken care of. And then whether you're working in public sector and you're on the front line and getting that information from the top to the person at front, it's difficult. I think that, that communicating frequently has been the one that I found the most challenging. And I also hear that as I train and as I work with people, that the communication piece is still trying to figure out the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. 
Are we communicating too much? Are we not communicating enough? Um, I think the trick is finding out what needs to be communicating and creating ways where you can to even automate some of those responses, Becky. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. You know, I think that, for instance, we are working off of a new platform that you developed internally that I absolutely love. But the way that you have automated that process is by putting it even on our calendar as a reminder to go and look at it on a regular basis. So you're not physically communicating with us to go over there and look and update, and but you've already identified that on our calendar. So you've created that regular communication to set that expectation to follow through. So Mm -hmm. that's you not now having to constantly remind us or send us emails, you've done your part. Now it's our part to follow through that other side of that communication because you've already laid it there. Does that make any sense when I say that? It does. It does. And I think on the other side of it, it's then trusting that you will take the time to review it. And that's just like one example, but I think it does require a lot of trust, but I can see where like communicating frequently is so important, but I'm really leaning into the the automation side right now and looking at different ways, like through Power Automate, um, which is like one tool through Microsoft where it's like, why can't it send out reminders automatically of the things that consistently come up? That way I don't feel like a broken record because I feel like that. And like, sometimes I'm like, yeah, second guessing myself. Like, I'm like, oh, it's another, it's another notification. It's another email, not on my side, but like, how is it being perceived? But I think, especially in the remote world, like if you think you're not communicating or if you think you're communicating enough, you probably aren't. And if you think you're over communicating, then you're probably communicating just enough, Mm -hmm. but it really you know, one word that stuck out to me is that consistency word. And I can definitely see how that builds trust, but, you know, we're also human and like make mistakes and do things inconsistently. How, how do we work through that consistency piece in order to build trust? It is a mindset. It's a mindset and a mind shift. I'll be very honest with you. I joked with you. One of the first things that gave me the the angst here was having to submit my own time. (laughs) I hadn't done that in a number of years. And so I had to shift my mindset and start doing this and say, no, Lakia, this has to be done every day. And so doing it every day. Because when you're waiting to do something, now you're playing catch up and you're back up against a deadline. So I think that creating those consistent practices, it is it's discipline, um, something that we don't talk about often because we want to be everything to everybody and get everything done. But it's a lot, it requires a lot of discipline to stay on track. It, it really does. And sometimes it's exhausting. And then it's like, uh, you know, from a work place balance is like, wow, like, you know, I got these things in order, but I swear I need to make this appointment with the dentist. (laughs) I need Mm -hmm. to do another follow-up. So it's a balancing act, Becky, because we bring our full selves to our spaces and and to our, our jobs, but we also owe it to ourselves to make sure we're having that balance in Mm -hmm. order to accomplish all these things. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is so true. And aren't we lucky to be able to bring our whole self to work? But that also means you need to put in boundaries for yourself. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And people, people going back to that trusting environment, I think that as leaders in, in organizations, being able to empathize and communicate in a way that allows your team to know that you care and that they can trust you will just bring so many dividends in the long term. Knowing what you say you're going to do, when you're going to say you're going to do it, it makes all the difference in the world. And so I think that that's really the core of that trust is, is doing what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. And then when we can't, though, being able to communicate a change and then being accountable to try to create a better method next time to avoid that delay. Hmm. You summed it up right there. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I love that. Well, we're, we're, I'm, I'm certainly still on, on that journey and it's, it's been really a pleasure to learn from you in this episode, but other episodes and then just in our meetings and uh, communicating with you frequently is something. Listen, I- ditto. I, I look forward to, and that's why guys, you know, she, I, I kind of do that word animate out there um, or automate, excuse me, our services a little bit. So Becky could get in. I wish she could have saw the, the light that lit up in her eye, you know, because you're doing some great and innovative things and, and automating some stuff that we're trying to do. So I look forward to, and hopefully some future episodes, being able to share that side of the work that you're doing here that can maybe help some of our listeners um, become even more efficient. So, but we appreciate you. Awesome. Thanks, Lakita. All right, everybody. Lakita, do you want to do it with me? Can we do it like in three, two, one? We'll say let's talk parks until next time. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. Let's Let's talk talk parks. parks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Appreciate you. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye-bye.